Okay, excellent. Thank you so much, Joshmita. It's a real pleasure to be here talking to uh, a group of young neuroscientists and aspiring technologists. Uh, I'll start by introducing myself again. Uh, so I, I'm the founder of Mycroft AI. I, I have a co-founder named Michael Lewis. Uh, you might recognize the name Michael Lewis as the author of a bunch of books, including um, uh, Liar's Poker and The Blind Side and Fast Boys and uh, Moneyball, which was made into a movie starring Brad Pitt. That is not my co-founder, Michael Lewis. Uh, Michael Lewis, my co-founder, uh, founded Stellar Semiconductor in the mid-1990s and sold it for Broadcom for $150 million in 2000, and then founded uh, Cryptic Studios, which made a game that you may have heard about called City of Heroes, which was a fairly uh, sizable and popular uh, multiplayer massive online game uh, in the mid-2000s, and went on to sell that uh, to Atari. Uh, you know, I've now taken a secondary role as an operator and a, and a promoter of our company and our technology. And, you know, as, as Jashmita said, my background is in building open networks that uh, invite everybody and deliver high-speed internet without spying on folks. Uh, and now I'm building voice technologies uh, that do the same thing, that are inclusive, that, uh, you know, target communities that might not be represented in the voice assistant movement, uh, communities that speak uh, languages without huge populations. Uh, and then of course, have a really strong focus on, on things like privacy and user agency, uh, things that are super important for the, the future of this technology. So what we're doing at Mycroft is we're building a privacy respecting artificial intelligence that gives the end users of the technology control over everything in their digital environment. Um, you know, when, when people look at the voice assistant space, it's really important to, for, to abstract away from, you know, the concept of a speaker that sits in the corner that you talk to and it does stuff, right? Which is the kind of the most basic description of a smart speaker and really think at the higher level of, about what that is and what it means, right? And you know, the, the reason that voice assistants and smart speakers have seen, seen such huge adoption is it's really the first mass marketing of uh, what we know as augmented reality, right? You know, when, when you watch the movies uh, about augmented reality, inevitably, you know, they talk about neural implants that uh, give information directly into your brain. Uh, a lot of times in film and movie, it's depicted as, as uh, you know, either ocular implants or, um, uh, contact lenses that have a, a, HUD, a HUDs up display on them and display information. Um, but in, in reality, the first broad adoption of augmented reality were these smart speakers that listen and transmit audio in a room and basically create an internet overlay over a space. And so when you take an empty room and you put a smart speaker in the middle of it, all of a sudden, anywhere within that room, you can both receive in information from the internet in the form of you know, responses to questions or music or audiobooks or you know, get audio games. Uh, and then you can also communicate to the internet uh, simply by speaking, right? And so smart speakers really are the first broadly adopted and broadly available augmented reality on earth. And it's why, you know, despite the fact that a lot of folks don't really understand what it is that they're putting in their home and what the implications of that. Uh, it's why the adoption of that technology has been so tremendously uh, fast paced. Um, prior to the adoption of, of smart speakers, the fastest growing technology ever in history, uh, grow faster than fire, faster than reading, writing, faster than any other human technology. Uh, the fastest growing technology ever had been smartphones. Uh, if you remember back in 2006, 2007, when the iPhone first came out, you know, the dominant players in that space at the time were uh, Nokia, uh, RIM, uh, Palm, and Microsoft were the ones who made all the operating systems for the smartphones. And they were really isolated to the business environment. Uh, in 2007, you know, Steve Jobs launched the iPhone and really, you know, showed the world a vision of what the future of smartphones were. And within two years, almost everybody, at least everybody I know had one, right? Is that the adoption was very, 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 very fast. Uh, smart speakers are actually growing faster than that. And so it, it is literally the fastest growing technology in the history of mankind. And the reason, of course, is because they have so much utility and they're so inexpensive to deploy. And so people are putting them in their living rooms, in their kitchens, they're putting them in their workshops, in their offices, they're starting to put them in retail and banks. 
you know, all, all of these touch points where people want to access the broader network, but where a touch screen doesn't necessarily make sense um, or where it, it's inconvenient or where, you know, the, the voice assistant makes more sense as a, as a computer touch point than, uh, you know, a, a classical computer input. Uh, the problem is that the companies that are deploying those types of technologies have ulterior motives. You know, they're, they're other than Mycroft, you know, today there is no smart speaker technology that you can deploy uh, within your home that doesn't in some way spy on you. Uh, just this week, they found that the Apple uh, HomePod mini, the little $99 Apple speaker, turns out has a humidity sensor and a temperature sensor in it that were undisclosed. And uh, so, you know, Apple was putting those in people's homes and collecting information about the surrounding environment uh, without, you know, making that clear to, to users. Uh, in the case of Nest thermostats, you know, they actually found a, a microphone uh, that was deployed in the Nest thermostats that once again was undisclosed to the end users. And then all of these companies across the board are under indictment. Um, in Google's case, they're under indictment by all 50 states, the federal government, the European Union, and a host of other international companies for their behavior um, surrounding both privacy and surrounding antitrust. And so, you know, when you look at this at this space, you know, it's very important that people understand that these always listening, always watching technologies, uh, you know, are being controlled by companies whose primary financial interests are served by understanding and spying on effectively. Uh, the end users of their technology so that they can uh, sell them other products in other spaces. In the case of Google, you know, it's to improve search and to drive uh, traffic to the various different tools that people pay for with Google. You know, Amazon, uh, you know, has a vested interest in getting people to buy stuff retail and, and even companies like Apple that have staked out a position in privacy still monitor the end users of their technologies in order to, you know, sell you more more laptops in order to sell you more speakers in order to keep you on Apple services and uh, to keep you as a, a revenue generating unit of their user community. Uh, and so, you know, that remains a huge problem, especially in the context of anti-competitive behavior from these companies. So it, it's one thing if you have a choice between a smart speaker that spies on you and a smart speaker that doesn't. Uh, but when big tech reaches in and uses their market dominance in one industry uh, to, to, to force uh, other sections of the industry to capitulate and to dominate those other, those other sectors, it harms consumers. And therefore, you know, as we're finding out from all the regulators, turns out that's illegal. Uh, and it's certainly not good for the end consumers of the product. Uh, you know, as a result of some of the behaviors that people finding hidden microphones in their technology, people finding hidden sensors in their technology, um, I'm sure almost everybody on this call has an experience where they said something in front of a speaker or a smartphone or a computer, and later on they went and to a website or something and found, you know, advertising targeting that specific statement um, starting to show up on their social media feed, starting to show up in their web browsing. You know, that, that type of behavior on behalf of big tech is really creating a strong demand for technologies that allow you to use uh, the internet and access information in private. Um, you know, folks are starting to become much more aware that the trade-off for using technologies for big tech um, really is a trade-off, uh, you know, trading their privacy for inexpensive services. And a lot of people are beginning to realize how much their privacy is really worth. And that, you know, it really isn't a great trade to trade, you know, universal surveillance and universal monitoring of, of yourself um, for, you know, the ability to send a tweet or listen to music on demand. Um, you know, the, the trade there is very much one-sided. And as people are becoming more and more aware of it, it's creating big opportunities within in industry for companies like Mycroft, for companies like DuckDuckGo um, that focus on providing Private, qu private search, private queries, private technologies, you know, that, that ensure that users can access all of the information they want, but without the um, Faustian bargain of trading away all of their privacy. And, you know, we've seen similar growth in, in, our, in our industry and in demand for our technology over the last five years as our, our friend Gabriel, who runs DuckDuckGo, um, which is kind of a privacy focused search engine uh, for those of you who are looking to do more on the internet and private, I, I'm a strong 
supporter of uh, Gabriel's DuckDuckGo. You know, the, the Brave web, web browser is also a fantastic way to maintain your privacy online. And then, you know, there are a, a host of other services, um, things like Tor, which uh, can be used to anonymize your web traffic and keep people from, from spying on it uh, to, you know, simple things like, you know, using a VPN back to a private IP so that your, your mobile phone carrier can't monitor everything that you're doing. Uh, increasingly, you know, the privacy aspects of internet use aren't necessarily applications. So it's not the web browser and it's not your email and it's not, you know, the, the software that you're using. Uh, increasingly, the internet service providers, especially in the United States, are, have gotten in on the game and are um, spying on their end users to see what they're doing so that they can target them with uh, advertising and advertising partnerships. Um, so it is something that, that I pay attention to, certainly, and I'd strongly encourage um, other folks to pay attention to. You know, when you look at, at, at markets for privacy, when you look at markets for voice assistance, you know, a few things really pop out. Um, you know, people, people want to use these types of speaking technologies in environments they're not familiar with. And so, you know, hospitality, so uh, hotels are a, a really good, um, are a really great place. And, and there's a lot of demand for voice assistant type technology that is private, right? Like a lot of times, you know, what people are doing in hotel rooms, they don't want to necessarily advertise to the rest of the world. And so, you know, they're not particularly interested in allowing the big tech companies to monitor them in that space. Uh, the same, of course, is for healthcare, which is uh, private, you know, through legal requirements through HIPAA, um, where, you know, people want to keep their health conditions and want to keep their healthcare and the services that they're uh, being provided by the healthcare industry private. Um, and yet there are great applications for voice in places like hospitals. Um, where patients can, you, you know, most hospitals don't even have a music player in their room. So you're paying in the United States $10,000 to $15,000 a night to stay in a hotel room that can't even, you know, play classical music on demand. Uh, so there's a, a lot of demand in that space for uh, voice technologies, you know, to, to offload some of the patient care from nurses to automated assistants. Um, and then, of course, to provide better services for patients. And, and we are working with a number of hospitals to deploy artificial intelligence uh, agents uh, in their rooms so that patients can use it to do simple things like play music or, or uh, uh, change the channel on the TV, uh, but also more complicated things, uh, including protocols that uh, where the voice assistant is responsible for telling COVID patients, for example, uh, to change position to prevent fluid buildup in the lung and then get acknowledgement from those patients that they have changed position, uh, which saves nurse, nurses from putting on PPE and entering the room in order to both prompt and confirm that patients have turned over onto their side or onto their stomach. Um, it's a really simple application today, but there are gonna be a lot of, a lot of additional applications going forward. Uh, and then of course support, you know, people uh, when they contact a company, um, you know, those companies don't necessarily want those conversations that they're having with their end, end customers uh, to be advertised to Silicon Valley, because in many, in many cases, those companies either already compete with Silicon Valley in a variety of different verticals, or in the future, they will compete. You know, our friends at, at Google have attempted multiple times to get into multiple spaces, everything from gaming to, uh, you know, internet service in, in developing countries, uh, you know, companies that compete with them in those spaces don't want to deploy voice technologies that send all that data back to them because of course, you know, all of the big tech companies have a track record of not respecting the privacy of their partners um, and using data that they acquire in sometimes um, pretty sleazy ways uh, to, you know, compete against them in, in unfair ways. So for us, openness and transparency are really the keys to what we do. So the, the concept with us is that, you know, we as a company are radically transparent. We broadcast our develop, internal developer sync meetings are published on the internet. You know, we have a community of more than 60,000 developers all over the world that contribute software and data. Um, you know, we do need data to build artificial intelligence algorithms. And so we ask our customers, you know, can we share your data? And, and here's what we want to you to understand exactly what that means. And we get about 5% of our customers make an affirmative choice to share their data so that they can improve the technology. 
um, rather than the way that Silicon Valley approaches it, which is they spy on everybody by default. And then if you go, go through some sort of Byzantine process, maybe they will stop spying on you. Um, transparency is, is really the, the, other key, the other key thing uh, uh, for us uh, in being successful in this space. Um, you know, all of our software is open and as a result, everybody can see into it transparently what every line of code does, you know, every server, every app, every API that's touched by that piece of software can be reviewed by the community. Uh, on the financial side, you know, we've typically funded the company through uh, crowdfunding campaigns, including uh, Reg CF public crowdfunding campaigns, which means that we have thousands and thousands of investors all over the world uh, who have visibility into how the company works financially. Uh, and then, of course, you know, us broadcasting our conversations to the world, the ones that we're having internally, um, really helps people to fully digest and understand what we as a company are doing and, and why we're doing things and to see, you know, how we react when inevitably we uh, make mistakes on the privacy front. You know, there have been, uh, I can think of a great example is we sent out a marketing email through a marketing firm that had a bunch of tracking pixels and other things in it. Uh, you know, the second we realized that that the company we were working with um, was using that email to monitor whether people were reading it and what they were doing on the internet as a result of it, you know, we reached out, terminated that relationship, reached out to our customers, you know, apologized for making the mistake, uh, made right on it, and, and, you know, were able to move forward. And that kind of openness and transparency builds trust with the community um, so that they know that when they put our technology in their kitchen or in their kid's bedroom, uh, you know, that we are not spying on them and they can inspect every single line of code in the software to see exactly what the company is doing and exactly how it works uh, so that they can be assured uh, that their, their communications and that their space remains private. Uh, the technology we're building, you know, we envision it in the future as really being built into almost everything. Uh, you know, voice assistants, you know, are extremely inexpensive to deploy. Uh, you can put them in a smart speaker for under $50, but you know, your phone already has two microphones in it, one for primary, one for noise cancellation. Uh, you know, increasingly set-top boxes have microphones in them, increasingly televisions have microphones in them, remote controls, uh, certainly automobiles. And in all of those instances, there are opportunities for companies like Microsoft to deploy uh, voice assistants that uh, make those technologies easier to use, whether it's you know, telling your car to parallel park via voice or telling your smart speaker to play David Bowie. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of utility in being able to just speak naturally to, uh, to your, your hardware. And, you know, what we're trying to build and what we have built is a software stack that allows companies and individuals to take that voice assistant and put it wherever they want to put it. So, you know, we worked very closely with Jaguar Land Rover in 2016 uh, on a pilot project, we recently did a lot of work with NASA on a pilot project. Um, you know, we've been working with speaker makers and uh, actually increasingly kid toy makers, um, all of whom, you know, want to deploy a voice technology, a voice assistant in their technologies to make them easier for their customers um, or their pilots or their drivers to use, uh, but don't necessarily want to in integrate technologies that monitor their customers from some of the industry players. And so for us as a company, you know, our goal has been to make Mycroft as portable and flexible as possible so that our, our company, corporate customer, customers and government customers and others can just take the stack and integrate it however they choose. And, uh, you know, if they choose to do that, uh, you know, and, and pay us as a vendor, great, but because we're an open source company, they can of course take that software and deploy it without us. Uh, and so, you know, that opens up a lot of doors for uh, companies and individuals that, that might not have the resources to pay for a, a voice integration or might have other, other needs in terms of, of privacy. Uh, so in terms of how our stuff works, uh, I know that this is kind of a, a technical meeting. Uh, you know, we have two layers to the, to the voice assistant stack. Uh, the first one is a backend. Um, you know, for us, that's that's a an online service that presents a, an an application programming interface and API uh, to the broader internet uh, that allows our customers to come in and create an account. Um, it allows them to securely store 
things like passwords and usernames for some of their services. So for example, if they have an account with Spotify, uh, they would be able to imp implement their credentials um, into our back end so that they can access it through the voice assistant. Um, you know, our devices call back to that back end and uh, automatically configure themselves based on the customer's data. Um, and then, you know, we, we make that, that data available, you know, at home uh, and then, you know, in a vehicle or anywhere else, uh, the customers might want to use it. So the, our back end is named Celine and, uh, you know, is, is a pretty, a pretty state of the art, but very similar to what you would expect for account management from, you know, anything from Roku to uh, Amazon Prime to any others that, that track the devices that connect to them. And then we have a marketplace uh, that we present for our customers as well that allows our developers to develop third party skills and make them available to the broader community. And so, you know, we have all kinds of different skills that are available from, you know, uh, object recognition skills that use the camera uh, to determine whether the customer is looking at the speaker or not. Or not. That's a technology called Wake Look, where we use a neural network to track the, the customer's gaze. When the customer looks at the smart speaker, it wakes it up and they can simply speak to it as normal uh, without having to say a wake word. Uh, two other skills like telling Chuck Norris jokes or flipping coins or um, pretty much uh, anything you can imagine having a conversation about, there's probably somebody in the Mycroft community um, that has built one. And then, of course, there are there are people who are building skills that that create money, uh, you know, and deploying them through Mycroft as well. Uh, things that create shopping lists and send them off to stores to be fulfilled. Um, people who are creating educational games that cost money. Um, and then people who are building complete private networks that do all kinds of crazy stuff with Mycroft. Um, you know, for everything from from helping to design satellites in NASA's case uh, to folks that are using it to to fly and control drones. Um, so you know, the marketplace is really where where we bring innovation into the company and into the community by making uh, raising awareness of the skills that people are building and then making them available uh, to other people in the community. Uh, there really aren't a lot of commercial voice assistant companies that uh, you know, are capable of going to consumer and enterprise. Uh, there is one out of Boulder called Josh.ai. Uh, there are a lot of them that are commercial and developer focused. SoundHound's a good example, uh, Linto. Uh, and then there's a bunch of research uh, projects that are out there. Uh, but in terms of building something that's uh, consumer focused, uh, building something that, that you know, actually generates revenue, so that you can you can afford to continue to to develop the technology, uh, we're kind of up there by ourselves. And there there used to be a bunch of additional companies in that space, but they keep getting bought. So, you know, as more and more of our competitors get soaked up into companies like Sonos and uh, I guess Peloton just bought one of our competitors last week, um, so they could voice enable their I guess their stationary bicycles. Um, you know, you know, we continue to occupy this kind of open source segment of the space. And, e and even if somebody did knock on our door and it did make sense for the company itself to get soaked up into some bigger commercial enterprise, you know, the fact that we're open source, the fact that, that everything's open and available, the fact that we've been 100% transparent uh, really creates opportunities for people to carry on with the, with the effort, um, you know, even if it makes sense for our investors for us to, to join a larger company. And right now, uh, we're shipping development kits, actually. Uh, you know, it, it's entirely open source. Um, you know, we have a big community of developers that are, are working on it. And uh, the team's working pretty closely now with contract manufacturers with a goal of starting to ship uh, our production smart speakers uh, sometime in the late third quarter, early fourth quarter of this year uh, globally, and we, we already have north of a million dollars worth of orders for those uh, and have actually been turning down orders over the past couple of years as we've been focusing on development as opposed to focusing on getting the hardware out the door. Uh, and so we're, we're pretty excited about where we are today and uh, about what we can provide. And we're really excited about the future of voice assistance and some of these artificial intelligence technologies uh, in the global tech workplace. So that's all I really have. Um, I'm happy to take a deep dive into pretty much anything and talk about pretty much anything. If anybody has questions or comments or um, 
you know, wants to know more about something, I'm, I'm happy to happy to oblige. Um, thank you so much for such a wonderful um, presentation, Joshua. Um, if any of you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, hi, I have a question. Sure thing. What's your uh, name? Sure. Uh, I'm Yen. Um, hi, Yen. So, okay. Uh, so I think, yeah, what you mentioned is this is absolutely an amazing project. Like, I think the most special thing about it is like it's open source and like many people can contribute to the project all the time. So what do you think is like, like, sometimes like open source project without like proper management it's hard to for it just to like fade away with not enough people to contribute to it so what do you think is the, the like the important things to keep an input uh, to keep an open source project alive sure so open source projects in order to be successful there's a couple of key ingredients uh, you know number one you need to be solving a problem that enough people care about that they're willing to make uh, time available. And so, it, you know, in our case, we're effectively building the computer from Star Trek or Jarvis from Iron Man, right? And uh, I mean, that's really was the inspiration behind the thing. You're, you're here in my lab, you know, the whole concept was that I could voice enable my lab and, uh, and, and, you know, connect the internet back to the space that I was really intrigued by the concept that this voice technology was a bridge between the real world and the virtual world. And, and you know, a great example of that, uh, one of the early projects we did, which we've since torn down, um, was a, a voice controlled laser pointer that would tell you where things were in the room, right? So, you know, my place is a bit cluttered uh, and we can use machine vision to find a hammer somewhere in the clutter. And I could ask the voice assistant, hey, Mycroft, where's the hammer? And the, the laser pointer would, would move to, to point at the hammer, right? And tell me where it was in the room, despite the fact I, as a human, like have trouble determining where the hammer is amongst all the rest of the clutter. Uh, you know, so you have to have a project that people are excited about and are willing to spend time in. So that's, that's number one, it needs to be a worthy project. There are a great, a lot of great projects out there that are very narrow, right? Like, you know, distributed databases and others, but it, it's difficult unless there's a commercial application uh, to get people excited about those. So, so that's number one. Uh, Long-term sustainability really comes down to financial sustainability. And, and you know, I, I don't know if you read it, but, um, you know, Richard Stallman rejoined the Free Software Foundation uh, this past week after having made a bunch of kind of vile and gross comments uh, at the beginning of the Me Too uh, movement. Uh, and, and Richard Stallman and I just fundamentally disagree about about software, you know, the, the Free Software Foundation, you know, has as it, you know, it has as its its mission and its vision, you know, hey, software scales infinitely for free, right? So once you write a piece of software, you can make as many copies as, you know, an infinite number of copies effectively for nothing. So why should people have to pay for it? Like that's the that's the concept behind the Free Software Foundation. And you know, my my response to that is money is also free, right? Like, you know most money just exists as ones and zeros in a bank, in a, in a database somewhere uh, in a bank. Like it's not like there's physical dollar bills or physical gold bars to back every, every dollar that's in the economy. Um, you know, why don't we give that away for free? Well, because, you know, it, it's important for there to be a good sound economics around anything that we do as humans. And, you know, open source software is the same way. Uh, you have to have it be commercially viable and it, you have to be able to compensate people for the time and the effort that they're putting in to improve the technology. Um, otherwise, it's just not sustainable. And so when you look at, at open source software projects that have been very successful, uh, you'll see that almost uniformly, they have a commercial company or a commercial entity attached to them uh, that is able to go out there and uh, get compensated in some form of value uh, for shipping that software. And, you know, that, that form of compensation can change from, from project to project, right? The, you know, Linus Torvalis at, with the Linux Foundation, um, I think the Linux Foundation exists almost solely on donations, right? Uh, Wikipedia is the same way. It's, you know, they do a, a 
retail campaign once a year and raise however many million dollars, and that's what they use to to run the uh, to run the project. Uh, projects that completely eschew the the financial side of things uh, generally, you know, rest on the shoulders of one or two martyr developers who spend, you know, 40 hours a week working at work and then another 40 hours a week working on their passion project. And event inevitably those people burn out, right? You know, if you want an open source project to be successful, the passion project has to be the day job, right? And that means figuring out a way to make it economically viable and providing real products. And so in our case, you know, you can use our Cellini backend and pair a Raspberry Pi speaker that you, a Raspberry Pi that you bought at the, your local micro center um, with, a, with a speaker and pay us nothing, right? And a lot of our customers do. Uh, but we also provide a path for folks to make a, a $2 monthly donation. And we get a, enough people who choose to make a financial donation every month um, and enough people who uh, are willing to donate data uh, to make the company financially viable into the future. Um, and then, of course, you know, as we've, we've started to work with bigger companies, you know, they want support and services and customization and a, and a series of other things to, that go with their you know, branded voice assistant. And that's an opportunity for us, uh, once again, to get paid. So, you know, the, the summary answer to your question is you have to be solving a real problem that people care about. And there has to be a way for the people who are investing their time and effort to get paid. Otherwise, open source projects have a tendency. Oh, I guess finally, you know, the projects that need support have a, you know, have an ongoing scope, right? So, you know, ping as a utility in Linux right, exists, has existed for like 30 years or something. You know, it's a very, very small chunk of code. Its utility really hasn't changed substantially in the last 30 years. So to keep that open source and keep it available is not a big deal because it doesn't need a lot of ongoing maintenance and support, right? That's very different for a modern voice assistant that involves four separate channels of machine learning plus a series of backend services and, you know, privacy agreements, you know, a security paradigm, so on and so forth. Um, those types of projects have to be have to have financial ongoing financial support. So, I hope that answers your question, Yen. Yeah, definitely. That was definitely very informative. Uh -huh. Thank you for your answer. Anyone else out there have anything? Um, yeah, I guess I have a quick question. If no one else has questions, yeah, um, absolutely. So, I mean, something I thought was really cool was like with other voice assistants, like the marketplace that they kind of support is very limited in its scope. But then like with Mycroft, it seems like you can really create whatever you want using like, I guess the voice behind the voice assistant. So like, how do you yeah. our, make ours sure? Will, that, yeah. Go ours ahead. will drop F-bombs. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. How do you like make sure that like the quality of like the marketplace is good enough to compete with like the big tech companies that like put money and time into like developing every single part of their device? Sure. So, you know, we have a paradigm called eight plus two, um, you know, eight, the eight skills are the eight primary skills that people use for a voice assistant for. So, you know, the number one use of a voice assistant is just general Q and A, you know, how tall is the Eiffel Tower type stuff, right? Um, right after that is music, right? And then the, you know, the, the things that people use them for are actually fairly limited. You know, people, they do use it for IOT type stuff. So turning on lights and, and things like that. Um, you know, they do use it for timers. People use it for alarms. Uh, and then they use it to consume media, right? Like to listen to audiobooks. Uh, but really beyond that, you know, despite the fact that the bigger players are like, we have 100,000 skills. And it's like, yeah, you've got like 75 copies of the dice skill that rolls a dice and gives you a random number between one and six, right? Um, you know, the, the place where we look to distinguish ourselves um, is number one in supporting those eight plus two with commercial effort, right? So, we, you know, the timers really do need to work well. Otherwise, people burn their house down when they're, when they're, timer doesn't go off for their macaroni and cheese, right? Um, you know, to support a good music skill so that, that people can use their smart speaker to listen to music. Um, but then, you know, making the rest of it open for, you know, real, really truly creative things. You know, we, we've had people build skills that do uh, 
you know, basically complete repertoires, right? So you can go through and programmatically tell it to, you know, turn on the lights and turn on the lawn sprinkler and, you know, play one music in one room, a different music in a different room and, uh, you know, run your garbage disposal, like whatever you have hooked up to IoT and, you know, give it that, give it one command to do that. Um, so, you know, opening it up so that people can be creative really causes people to be creative and do interesting new and novel things. Uh, and then, you know, in our case, opening up the entire user interface. So, for example, you know, one of the limitations of the, the larger industry smart uh, uh, voice assistant technologies is push notifications, right? So, uh, you know, one of the reasons we're even working with the hospital who developed something on a, another platform before they called us is there was just no way for them to do push notifications. And what they needed to do is they needed to have a dashboard at the nurse's station where the nurse could hit a button and initiate a behavior on a smart speaker in a patient's room, right? And push that behavior over to the smart speaker, at which point the smart speaker asked the patient, you know, uh, on a, excuse me, do you have a second, right? He gets a response on a scale of zero to 10, what do you, how, do you, how would you rate your pain today, right? And to, to collect that piece of data from the patient, um, that type of behavior isn't allowed on the other voice assistants. And then, you know, a whole host of other things, right? Like direct access to the operating system so that you can uh, manipulate IO on the device. Um, you know, the ability to swear. I mean, you wouldn't think it was a big deal, but some people want a foul mouth voice assistant. Um, the ability to, to really use it however they choose to use it because it's their technology. You know, I, I think that the paradigm difference between what we're building and what the big tech companies uh, have built is really the concept of user agency. And, you know, for, for those of you who don't know, uh, user agency is the concept that the technology you use works for you, right? So when I ask my computer to book me a flight from uh, my home here in Kona, Hawaii to Los Angeles, it goes and selects the best airline and gets the best price on the best schedule for me, right? Instead of where the other big tech companies are, where the voice assistant is an agent for the company, right? At which point, if I ask it for a flight, it'll give me the one that gets the most financial, that provides the most financial reward to the platform, right? And, you know, th those are two very different approaches to technology. And, you know, we as a society right now are in danger of having a global technology stack that works for the mega companies that manage it and doesn't work for us as individuals, right? where we are simply a unit of economic, uh, we are simply a unit of economic value for these big tech companies that consumes their services and coughs up, you know, money in the form of data and actual money, uh, not the other way around, right? Where, you know, they work for us and make our lives better. And, and I think that, that when you look at the, some of the current debates that we're having around privacy, the, some of the debates that we're having around um, you know, misinformation on social media networks, you know, really, as you abstract away, you know, the immediate arguments about racism and sexism and, you know, all these other, um, all these other components of the problem, the base problem is that Facebook works for Mark Zuckerberg, not for me, right? The base problem is that Google works for Larry and Sergey, not for me, right? And so for me and for us, you know, I think it's really important to build technologies that, you know, encompass the concept of user agency that, so that the voice assistant that will eventually have access to your bank account, all the IoT stuff at your home, all of your media on your, your all your media storage, your files, your, your internet history, like all of this information that these technologies will eventually have access to, that they use that information to benefit the customer and not to benefit the company. I don't know if I got off track there, but I hope that that, that is responsive. Oh, yeah, that definitely answers my question. And I guess, like, I haven't really thought about it. I don't think, like, a lot of people, like, in the general public, like, have thought about how, like, in the future, if it's only big tech kind of having access to everything, like, they'll have access to, like, all these private things that you will eventually give them without even, like, knowing you're giving it to them. So I think it's, like, a good start that, like, Companies like Mycroft AI for like voice, like Dr. Go for search are like working on this field. So yeah. Yeah, I think it's 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 really important because I mean in a lot of ways you, you talk about it as a 
a future problem, but it, it, in a lot of ways, it's already here, right? Like, you know, even if you don't have a Facebook account, they keep a shadow profile. They know a ton about you, even if you don't have an account with the company. And, you know, I would argue in many cases, the tech companies know more about us than we know about ourselves. I think that the classic case in point is, uh, you know, all of the, the future fathers or, um, uh, you know, parents who found out that their wives and daughters were pregnant um, because all of a sudden Target Corporation started sending them advertising, uh, you know, that for, for baby type materials, right? So, you know, what was happening was, you know, Target based on people's shopping patterns was able to identify that women were pregnant in some cases before women know that women were pregnant, right? Before they knew they were pregnant, the store knew it and started marketing materials towards them. And in a lot of cases, their, their spouses who went to go get the mail and all of a sudden there's all this stuff for baby gear, you know, they go to their wife or their daughter and say, what, what's going on with this? Why are we getting all these advertisements for, you know, cribs and diapers? Like, you know, are, are you pregnant? Right. Um, you know, that's the type of thing that has already occurred. And that's actually pre Facebook, pre Google stuff. Right. Um, you know, these guys have huge amounts of information about us. And you know can anticipate our behavior and manipulate our behavior in ways that 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 you know you guys are neuroscientists. I mean you can manipulate people with a clicker, right? I mean the, the they're manipulating people in order to make money based with all this information. You know I, I think that the time for us to be focusing on this type of thing was actually ten years ago, um, but it's certainly good that that people are starting to pay attention to it now, and you know, are willing to put their money where their mouth is, right? Like for me, right? Um, I'm more than happy to pay the $10 fee to Pandora or Spotify to not listen to advertising and not have them track me um, than to get their free music service and be constantly barraged by advertisements and people trying to abuse my time and manipulate me to buy their products. Um, and I think that more and more people are starting to, to move in that direction and think, hey, you know, I... I would rather pay for a product than be the product. And, uh, and, and that's a good thing. And you know, it's certainly good for us on the financial side. And I think it's good for society as a whole. Because um, yeah, you don't trust Facebook and Google with your information. What about, uh, uh, what about Assad, right? Like you really want him to have all the information about all, everybody in his country? He hasn't really treated them with a lot of respect in the last 10 years. Um, thank you. That was very insightful. Um, does anyone have any other questions? I guess maybe one last question if no one else has questions. So like, you kind of talk about like search and then now you're talking about voice assistance. What do you think could be like the next field that could kind of be like converted into like this type of fashion? Uh, I see the next huge opportunity is Starlink, honestly. Uh, you know, when you look at Uber and Lyft and the genesis of those companies, the underlying idea, even though the founders, when they founded the company, didn't really fully understand what they were, what they were building, the, the underlying concept was we now all have a screen that is connected to the internet that has a GPS in our pocket. What business can you build with that brand new technology? And it turns out that a, a great application of that technology is calling a ride. Right, because you know where the phone is. You've got a network connection. You can connect the car, who also has the GP, the location and a network connection. You can connect the driver with the rider, and boom, away you go. Now you've got a hundred billion dollar business. Right, the Starlink satellites that Elon's putting up uh, in Texas or in in Florida uh, are really a game changer. Um, you know, I come from Kansas, where you know you get outside of city limits, and broadband service is almost non-existent. Um, in fact, when you look at mobile phone coverage, it really only encompasses something like 20% of the Earth, Earth's surface has mobile phone coverage. And even then it's hit and miss depending on what carrier and what frequency and what country and what you know, random regulation uh, is in place. Uh, you know, Starlink as a technology is gonna make broadband internet available anywhere on the surface of the Earth, 24 hours a day at high bandwidths with low latency for almost nothing, right? So 
if you want high speed internet at some island in the middle of the Pacific or, you know, deep into the into the wilderness of Antarctica or, you know, in the, the jungles of Central America, um, where there just really is no infrastructure today, all of a sudden overnight, like in the next 24 months, you're going to be able to do that. And so, you know, the question becomes is what new businesses does that enable? You know, and, I, and I, if I had that answer, I would be out pitching VCs with it right this second. But, um, but you know, I, there are some obvious things like, you know, housing all of a sudden becomes, disc, you know, between solar panels, modern water treatment technologies and Starlink, like all of a sudden it really isn't going to matter where you live. Um, you know, I, I think that that's certainly an opportunity. Uh, I think that the other place that we're starting to see real movement, it's kind of a shame that, they're, that they've done it in a way that only big companies can access it. Uh, is, is what will eventually be, you know, ubiquitous uh, matter switching networks. Um, you know, the, a lot of the, the te even technologies like Mycroft are really enabled by IP switch networks. So I take a packet of information, I drop it into a network and the network figures out how to get it from point A to point B. I don't have to think about it or switch a circuit or have dedicated infrastructure to get, the, you know, the packet of voice that I'm speaking here in Hawaii to all of you in, in Illinois, right? Um, the, matter switching networks will be very similar is the, you know, really, uh, you know, low cost drone technologies will be able to go ahead and pick up packets and move them into a network. And you as the, as the beneficiary of that, you know, simply need to tell it where to go and set it out. And the matter switching network will take it from point A to point B. And, you know, there, there are obvious applications of that, things like, you know, they're, they're already using drones for medical, for medical purposes and medication delivery. Um, but I suspect that there are tons and tons of non-obvious applications for that. And so I, I think the combination of matter switching networks and ubiquitous internet access um, are really going to open up significant new opportunities and new industries for entrepreneurs who have ideas and the ability to execute on them. So anyway, it, it sounds like the room has gone silent. And uh, if you folks don't have anything else, I will hop. I apologize for the time zone snafu um, two weeks ago, but I hope that I hope this was in some way entertaining for y'all. And uh, you know, send a copy of it over to Google and see if I get sued. <laughs> yeah. So I guess then, if there aren't any more questions, um, thank you so much for coming, everyone. And thank you so much, Joshua. That was very cool and insightful. And um, I learned a lot about AI today and I really enjoyed the presentation. So thank you so much for attending everyone. Thank you for your time. Thanks folks, talk to you soon.